You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. On the right side, taking Belaga's spot. Second down and two. Little flip here to Jones. Gets a block. And Jones out in front. They're trying to chase him down. Get him the ball, and there's just no way that they can compete with Aaron Jones in that kind of space. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. You can text the show at 865-658-5824. We're live on YouTube and Twitter. Got my buddy Jacob here from the Packernet Fantasy Podcast. And we're just going to talk a little pre-camp. Um, you know, we were on live earlier today and and had an uh, awesome surprise. Tim from Green Bay jumped on with me, and we kind of talked about a little bit about defense, really, Jacob. We were talking about some of the defensive fronts and and how you know kind of debunking some of the stuff that that people have said about Joe Barry's defense and how you know he's just so predictable and this and that. We we literally on the openers, a seven play opener there in the Rams game, which you and I were at. He showed so many. He didn't show the same defensive front uh, two times on that entire drive. I mean, there was combinations from 9-2-I on one side to 9-3 to 7-3 to 4-I-9. Like, it was it was pretty sporadic. And on top of that, um, we basically highlighted two of the seven plays. There was miscommunications, which led to a first down, um, which kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with what we talked about. You know, during the season, you would see that from time to time. So what we're going to do here, Jacob, is kind of talk about the openers on offense in that Rams game. Um, there's 11 plays. We want to talk about run-to-pass ratio. We're going to talk about pre-snap motion just to kind of give people an idea of what it was they were running as we were coming down the stretch last year. And and to me, you got to kind of break the season up. Most most coaching staffs, from what I understand, I don't pretend like I'm in the building, but uh, most coaching staffs, from what I've heard, they break the season down into quarters. And you do kind of a self uh, a self scout per quarter, more or less. So every four or five games, you know, with the – the addition of the 17th game, obviously there's a, an odd number there, but usually three to five game saturation. You want to self-scout, make sure you're not too predictable, and just kind of uh, changing things up. So we ended the season fairly strong, in my opinion. You know, I think we went four and one in the last five games. Unfortunately, we lost the game that we needed to get in the playoffs, but that's the way it goes. Um, first things first, though, how's your day been? And is there anything that kind of sticks out to you? I know you were, you were in the chat when we were doing the defensive talk earlier. Did anything stick out to you or anything at all you want to say before we get started? I mean, my day's been good. I uh, started to work early today. I'm going to have to go back there. I might have to miss the end session tonight because we have a late catering, but whatever. Um, gotcha. Yeah, what I, what I looked at when I was listening to you and Tim, which I love Tim's insights. He's a really breath of fresh air there. I like that a lot. Really is, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and it is uh, – we talked about a little bit of, like, uh, how the offensive schemes now are scheming towards being very pass-friendly. Um, if you look at the running back free agency market, like, you can kind of see how that's 
a definite thing. I mean, you look at a guy like you said, I think um, Ezekiel Elliott or Elliot, Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah. 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 yeah Ezekiel He's like Elliott. the best guy in between the tackles, maybe arguably for the last five years. And this guy is, he's on, you know, you look at Kareem Hunt, you look at Dalvin Cook, you look at uh, a lot of these guys. I mean, this is Aaron Jones. People say that he took a pay cut. Um, did he though? Or yeah. <laughs> Love did it. he take a pay cut or did he really just understand the market and realize his worth? And as we talked about with running backs, um, their worth, we can, we can definitely get into that if you want to, but it's like uh, a running back isn't the same as a running back in 1970. Right. So right. a running back now has to be able to pass protect. He has to be able to catch the ball like a lot, a lot out of the backfield. You got a guy like Austin Eckler or um, a Christian McCaffrey yeah, those guys maybe are going to get that high number value, but an Aaron Jones, he's going to take that pay cut just because maybe we don't use him enough in that avenue, which again is another conversation we could talk about. But you look at another guy like like a, a Nick Chubb, um, who else? Uh, Derrick Henry, you know, like guys that are just running backs, you right. know, and and I don't know if that that if you look at the analytics like Ryan talked about. Um, it's just, it's just the money's not there. And like you talked about as a business owner, I think that's what you touched on, on one of your first podcasts. You just, not, you're not going to put your money where the money's not worth. You know right. what I mean? And so uh, yeah. I, I posed the question um, earlier in your chat for the first uh, stream you did today. It's like, well, do, will that, will the NFL ever get back to that? I don't know. Um, yeah. You said, Probably not, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it. If you go back to that, then what you're saying is, okay, we're we're putting all of our eggs in this basket of we're just going to pound the freaking rock and we're going to pound it down your throat. But what people, I don't want to say they don't understand, but it's it's what a lot of people are missing is all a team has to do then is load the box. Like it's right. it's truly that simple, especially with run stunning, which me and I think it was me and Coach Haddad talked about the other day how Carolina two years – I think I said last year, but it was actually two years ago. They started off real strong like the first quarter of the season like we're talking about. They had a real stout run defense, and they were doing stunt run defense um, up front, which is basically they're running stunts uh, within the uh, the defensive trenches. And it's hard for offensive linemen, especially in wide zone, to pick their spots and block efficiently when you don't even know where the defensive line is going to be, you know, right. it's not just a straightforward approach. So with that being said, yeah, I don't, I don't ever, you know, see a scenario where that plays out and, you know, it's, it's, it's back to the explosive plays. And I had somebody, uh, you know, message me and tag me in Twitter and say, that's stupid to think that explosive plays are that important. Uh, you can't just go out there and chuck the ball down the field. I'm like, bro, you're, you're hearing what you want to hear. <laughs> Nobody's saying go out there run four verts and we'll, we'll heave it up yeah. to you. Nobody's saying that. Every play is designed, not every play, but probably 90, 95% of the offensive play calls are designed to have a shot within it. That's an old Bill Walsh tactic. He came from the old run and shoot style, I guess you could say, but it was yeah. basically Air Coriel, Sid Gilman, their approach to vertical passing back when that was like taboo back in those days. Yes. Um, and what he did was he said, you know, once he had to go to his backup quarterback, which you've heard me tell the story a thousand times in Cincinnati, when he was one of the offensive assistants to Paul Brown, the starting quarterback goes down. The backup quarterback was accurate, quick processor, uh, kind of an agile guy. It was, hey, let's stretch the field horizontally. So they came up with this short passing system. But what they also did was kept one or two shots in the barrel on every play so that if the defense tightened up on that horizontal passing game, you could take that shot. That's what we mean by when you take the shot explosively. Explosive play can be a – it could be a, a, a wide receiver screen that goes for 25 yards. That's still an explosive play. So the people that think that explosive plays are just chuck and duck down the field is – you're kidding yourself. What we're pointing out is how defenses have started to go to this quarters look because it limits – those quick vertical shots, right? So, um, yeah, to answer your question, that's a long-winded answer, but I don't see it coming back to that. I think you're going to see balanced attacks, people playing off of – and it all is going to be matched to their personnel as well, Jacob. You know, if you've got a great quarterback that's extremely accurate, you know, 15, 20 yards down the field, you're going to throw the ball down the field, you know? Or do you see 
uh, like I said in the in the chat, do you see the running backs becoming more of a wide receiver hybrid? Like if you get drafted in the first, second, third round, you have to be basically a wide receiver slash, like kind of how like the tight end uh, fullback, H back kind of thing happens. Mm-hmm. Do you see that as progressing in the NFL where it's like, okay, we're going to draft you. Like you did a lot of great stuff in college. You did like you, you broke the boards in college. That's great. But can you progress that to the next level? And if you can, you're not just a hard nosed runner. You're more of like a, uh, a dual threat. Right. And I think that is that something you see uh, more prevalent? Yeah. It's, it's like we said in the earlier stream, it's hard to find people to fit that mold because college really isn't geared like that right now. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of spread, a lot of air. We're talking fullbacks though. Right. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> again, name a college fullback, right? I can't that's, do it. That's, that's how I got I'm, a guy. I, I can't remember his name. I, I exactly. said it on this podcast. I freaking said it on this podcast. He was a tweener. He had like a 9.9. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and what you'll see is teams will take shots on those guys. They won't get drafted. They darn sure won't get drafted, but they'll, they'll invite them into camp and go, Hey, can, can they be a use check type? Right. But back right. to Aaron Jones, I'm glad you, spun it back around because I did want to say people like Aaron Jones, running backs like Aaron Jones, which by the way, if you guys aren't following him on Instagram, go follow him. He had an awesome video earlier. Just, just doing stuff to help people out, man. He's just, God, what an amazing, Such how blessed are we to have Aaron Such Jones, a good freaking person. Green Bay Packer. Oh, but anyway, um, you, that's, that position is what I refer to as T right. And, and you can call it bunk bed. You can call it whatever you want. Um, I've always re- heard it referred to as T, right? Mainly for tailback, but they when they flex him out into the, the route as a wide receiver, he's referred to as the T receiver. Uh, you look at those type of running backs, Jacob, they're getting paid. They're the ones that are getting paid. And what you said about Aaron Jones, I'll never forget when they signed him to that contract. Uh, it wasn't really a contract extension because he hit free agency. And when he hit free agency, I knew, and, and I told my buddy Willie, who's a big Buffalo Bills fan, um, we were all in this big chat, you know, talking about free agency. And when he hit the market, I said, they're letting him test the market, right? Which is really smart. And I know people don't want to hear this is any more than or any less than I want to say it. A.J. Dillon most likely will hit the market. They're going to let him test the market because yeah. the market is down, right? That's a good thing for the Packers. Don't over. Typically, you get about a 20% discount on signing a player before they hit free agency. Yeah. But when it comes to running back, I mean, hell, Jacob, Dalvin Cook made the top 10 list, top 10 running backs list, and he ain't even on a team. How does that happen? He's gone. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because, Which, by the way, did you, uh, I don't want to get into it real hard, but uh, no. Dalvin Cook, did you see any of that uh, stuff with him? Mm-mm. Oh, you didn't? Are you serious? Oh, no. You want to spill oh, the tea please. real quick? Is it, uh, should we well, spill it here? Um, maybe there's a reason that he got released. I'll just say that. Uh, oh, there is okay. a dispute between him and a lady um, who says that he, may have struck her in certain ways and blah, blah, blah. So look, let's just, you know, Viking fans, just saying, uh, seems to be a common situation, but I'll just leave it there. Um, It seems as if that that may be a reason that Dalvin Cook is not being jumped on as if some prime uh, prospect. Did you also see what happened with uh, Addison? Yes, I did see that. Man, And again, I don't want to. I don't want to just you know Bro, talk it's smack, been, but if it's there's been like a, there's, down here, Georgia, the University of Georgia, or like street racing. What dirt, is that, dude? It's crazy. I don't. What I, is it? Atlanta, I don't understand that. Atlanta, Georgia, and you know Georgia, you know where where Athens is. It's close enough to to Atlanta that I feel like that that whole thing kind of spills in. Um, you know, Atlanta was kind of the street racing birthplace. A say, lot of people don't like, know that. You drive um, fast and you leave a sexy corpse. That's what that's they talk about. Yeah, there you go. Man, I'll tell <laughs> you, it's uh, it's bad. It's real bad. And Kirby Smart's down here trying to put every – every time he puts a fire, it's like the old Three Stooges skit, you know, yeah. where they, they're in the boat and Curly, you know, punches a hole in the boat and it starts leaking. And what's he do? <laughs> well, we got to get this water out. Let's punch another hole in the boat. And, <laughs> I mean, that's literally Kirby Smart running around like a, like a chicken with his head cut off in, uh, in Georgia. Yeah. But – yeah. Um, yeah, so not looking good. And you guys know Jordan Addison was my top receiver this last draft. I liked yeah, him more than anybody. Man, if the <laughs> Packers would have took him and then he wanted to get out there and go too fast, too furious, that would have sucked. <laughs> that would have sucked. But um, so Aaron Jones' contract, though, what I was saying about my Buffalo Bills buddy, 
when I told him the guaranteed money, I don't remember what it is right now, but I said, it's being reported this was the guaranteed money. And he went, no way, Clayton, it's, it's impossible. And I was like, that's what they're reporting. I showed him the link. He said, if they signed Aaron Jones for that kind of guaranteed money, that is the still of free agency is what he said. And it was. Now, check it out. It was low on guaranteed up front, right? The overall number looked great. But then what happened? They structured it in a way that if Aaron Jones – had hit the wall last year. And I hate even saying this about a guy that's such a good guy. Um, if he had hit the wall last year, they could have just cut bait and, and been a lot better off. But what did it give right. them room to do? Hey, look, dude, you see the market right now, right? Are you sure you want to go out there and test those waters? How about we do this? How about you lower the overall number that's your current contract? We convert some salary to guaranteed money in your pocket and you get paid right now and you get the security you need. You don't have to worry about hitting free agency and getting lowballed. And you're good to go, um, and and that's what they did. And 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 to 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 your point, Jacob, when you look at the guaranteed money or the the overall money he's going to make this year, I think it's like over 11 million, right? Yeah. So there you go. You know, it's a, a little bit more, I think, than the franchise tag would warrant for a running back. Of course, he wouldn't. You know, they couldn't use the franchise tag on him because he was under contract. Um, I think it's a win-win for both sides. But as far as A.J. Dillon, now there's a chance that A.J. Dillon, as much as he loves Green Bay, and I don't want to say this because I want Dillon to get his money too, um, there's a chance that that he goes to Green Bay and says, hey, man, I, I, I want a team-friendly deal. I really want to be here, and they get it done. But if I he's really one that, think that's going to happen. I really yeah. do. Now, if he's one, and rightfully so, if he's one that says, man, I, you know, I, 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 need to, I need to get paid because you know how running backs get beat up, then his, I could see them letting him test free agency. His wife's family is here. That's all I need to say. Yeah, 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 no doubt. You know what I'm saying? Like his wife's family, you know what that means, right? Like you're stuck, bro. You're stuck. And, <laughs> yeah. and he said like when he was a rookie, he's like, I, I got introduced to the city, got introduced to the state. And he was it too. Quoted, he's like, I don't, I don't ever want to leave. He said, I never want to leave. Like you can yeah. look back at a lot of his tweets, a lot of his uh, Instagram posts. I don't see that guy trying to negotiate a deal to get out of Wisconsin. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no doubt. I love this. Dude. We had we had a complete agenda for this episode. Yeah, it went off. And the we we're 16 <laughs> minutes in. We have not touched anything, and now we got people asking awesome questions in the chat. But Steve Van Ness, first of all, drops in and says, "Hey, I see you got my jersey on the wall back there." there he is. <laughs> that was a gift from the wife. She surprised me the other day, and this is how Mandy is. I come home, and and she she knows how like how busy and oblivious I am. I'm constantly I'm in the house. I'm out. I'm running you know running like crazy, and and she just set it on the counter, bro. I come in and then all of a sudden I look up and I go, is that a? I was like, what jersey is? That? I don't remember ordering a jersey. And I looked at it and it said Van Ness. I seen the autograph. I was like, did you get me a Van Ness jersey autograph? And she just grinned and walked off. So yeah, that's Steve Van Ness back there. Yeah, I'll tell um, you a story about Mandy. Uh, we went to the Rams game together. It was the first time I ever met Clayton and. Uh, I don't remember what court it was, something like that. I, I walked up because there was a, rare, a really long line to get, you know, anything as it is always. Yeah. Um, and I brought down some actual Packers cheese curds and I just handed it over to Manny. And she was just, I like Clayton, I know she loves you, but <laughs> when I handed her those cheese curds, I swear to God, she was like, <laughs> Twinkle all, right. In the eye, wasn't there? all right, all right. <laughs> So if something ever happens to Clayton, <laughs> if, he, you know. if he gets eaten by a shark, uh, whatever, watch out. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, she's uh she's a trip, dude. She's such a blast. She she absolutely fell in love with Nicole. Um, you know, uh uh Justin's, Justin's wife. Um, it was just cool. It was cool meeting everybody for yeah. sure. Uh she Brad probably knows says, how to beat him beat him up now, right? Yes, yes. All right. Um Brad in the chat says, hit that like, hit like people. Yeah, I appreciate that, Brad. And, and for those of you that are listening to this uh, on YouTube and Twitter as well, um, go subscribe to the channel. You know, if you like this kind of content, you don't have to turn notifications on, but by subscribing, it does help us kind of get out there. I had several people message me a couple episodes ago and said, hey, man, I'm so glad that YouTube recommended you to me. I don't know what that means, but evidently where we're getting so many views right now, it's videos are being recommended to people. Maybe it's popping on their homepage. I don't know. I'm I'm a dumb redneck from Tennessee. I don't understand how that stuff works. So, but anyway, if you hit like, you hit subscribe, that helps us a lot. That's all I know. Um, Steve Van Ness in the chat said, I want to ask you both, who's your favorite Packers player of all time? Jacob, does one come to you got to say the first thing that comes to mind. Right. Anytime somebody asks a question like this, right. the answer is whether you want to admit it or not, whether I want to admit it or not, Who's the first person that comes to mind? I know it's mine's Curly Lambo. Reggie. 
Reggie. Reggie. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big yeah. I'm a big Curly Lambo guy because uh, I'm just a history nut. And if somebody said you could only you could only have a conversation about a, one player for the rest of your life, dude, Curly's story is just phenomenal. And Reggie's yeah. a great one too. The, the only reason I love Reggie so much, or I shouldn't say the only reason, is just because um, it was a two factor thing. It was like it was when I was young and I was yeah. just about the age I was, uh, gosh, four, maybe five, right around the time you remember your first memories and you really hold them dear to your heart kind of thing yep. and i remember like my family being like that dude's insane like he's <laughs> he's just insane and also uh yeah that, that just the amount of like i remember getting a reggie bar i don't know if i told you that before but in wisconsin they had a reggie white candy bar and uh yeah like, they had a gilbert brown burger when he was doing his thing i really wish wisconsin would start doing stuff like that again i want him to have her like a rashawn gary burger or something like yeah. that you know what i mean like i want him to start doing some stuff like that it's dude great. i'm a i'm a sucker for that type of stuff man I'll, I'll buy wheaties boxes and all that. i have all right all you want to see yeah. something clean hold on yeah let's see it. hit on. me with it. We'll, we'll stay in the chat here steve van ness in the chat says dylan will want to stay here in Green Bay, mark it down. Like I said, Watson will break all of Jerry Rice's records. Dude, Steve, right. I know this, Steve. You are um, – All right. You, you are – My Steve. late grandmother gave oh, look me this at box. This. Hold on. Can we get that out of focus? That is for the uh, – I see it. You got that? Oh. Super Bowl champions winning box. If I ever – like if the actual – Zombie apocalypse happens. I'm gonna have to eat this <laughs> shit. I don't want to do it. Sorry. <laughs> it's gonna be in the bug out bag, ain't it? You gonna take it? That's in my bug out bag right here. <laughs> I love it. Anyways. Steve here, man. Let me let me say this, Jacob. Steve keeps saying that 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 uh, Christian Watson's gonna break all Jerry Rice's records. I'm gonna tell you this, Steve. <laughs> I personally, I'm one of the weird people. I'm one of those weirdos that believe in the power of the spoken word. So you keep saying it, brother. Keep yeah, speaking. Let's go. Keep speaking. I'm all about it. Ryan hates before. that. He hates that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh did you get my text question, Clayton? Man, I am slacking. I've done so many streams, dude. I'm gonna get to it. Brad, I will see if I can find it. Um, and I'll get back to you on it for sure, man. Um, I've I got it. Yeah, yeah, I do see it here now. I do see I have a text message. Um, all right. Steve Van Ness says, I always hit the like and subscribe. Uh, us Packer fans are family. Absolutely. Here's his answer. He says, Lambo, Jim Taylor, and Don Mikowski. I was called the magic man in high school. Look at my guy going back to the high school days. I love it. <laughs> love it. Back when I had a decent back and I could run more than a mile. My goodness. <laughs> it's the good old days. Let's do this, man. Let's kind of jump into a little bit of what we wanted to talk about. Um, <laughs> we're at the 21 minute mark. I was gonna say 20 minutes. In. I, I want to point this out because it goes hand in hand with what we covered earlier with the defense, right? And All just right. to just to kind of debunk a few things that's been said. Um, you guys know I'm doing a five game saturation. Those last five games of the season, I'm going through and watching all 20 uh, all 22 tape, and I like to do that just to kind of get primed up for camp because we know this is this is the last version of the Packers team we've seen. Again, I break the season down into, you know, pretty much quarters. So when you break it down into quarters, what you end up having happen is you see a team kind of evolve, right? You know, for a four-week span, like the first four weeks of the season, looking good, right? Second four weeks, hot garbage. The the Then starting into the third quarter of the season, started to turn it back up after they struggled, and then they, of course, won four of their last five games. Um, I like to look at those in segments and go, okay, what was what was working, what wasn't? Were injuries a concern in that, during that time frame, all those things? Well, what I found was during the saturation, one of the games I'm breaking down, Jacob, I was talking about it earlier, was the Rams game that we were at. And uh, this opening drive, I like to key in on the openers because that really tells the tale. That tells the story of, okay, um, what was the team trying to accomplish? What did they think was the best way to attack an offense? And what's the best way for a defense to defend those openers? You know, I talked about how Bill Walsh created the openers, uh, scripting plays. He is the founder of that. Bill Walsh is just, if you ever get a chance, Jacob, you want to listen to an audio book, book or read one, anything on Bill Walsh, bro, is just absolute gold. You'll, you'll find out. He created that? He invented that? Can I interrupt you one time? Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I learn everything I know about football from you. 
lately. And that's no, what's God awesome. love you. You're Bill hurt. Walsh. <laughs> Bill, Bill, Bill Walsh was almost about to be a Packers coach. Was that correct? That is true. I'll tell that story real quick. I know it pretty good. Right, it still right, depresses right. me. Um, <laughs> so what basically happened, Bill Walsh got he 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 got his start with the Oakland Raiders, and then he briefly went to another professional football league where he was the general manager and coach and he won the championship. And then Paul, uh, Paul Brown, who, if you guys don't know, Paul Brown is the reason they call the Cleveland Browns, the Browns, because Paul Brown was this legendary coach and it was his football team. They just referred to him as the Browns. That's, that's Paul Brown's team. That, that's the Browns. When they ran him out of town, when Art Modell bought the Cleveland Browns, they, they ran him out of town and Cincinnati hired him. So Paul Brown went on to Cincinnati and done great things, right? That's why you've heard Paul Brown Stadium, all that stuff in the past. Well, he hires a young Bill Walsh to be an offensive assistant. Hillman, I believe it was Billy Johnson, I think was his name. Johnson was definitely – yeah, Bill Johnson, I believe, was the other offensive mind there. Well, when it came time for Paul Brown to step away, it was his, his uh, responsibility to choose who was going to be the next head coach for the Cincinnati Bengals. So what he did was he chose Johnson, right, over Bill Walsh. And his reason was he didn't believe that Bill Walsh was mentally strong enough to handle being a head coach because he was very, very high, very low, you know, uh, extremely happy when things are going good, extremely low when things were going bad. And, you know, whether you agree with it or not, that's a pretty good assessment of, okay, that guy might not be a good leader. So you can understand where he was going. But here's Bill Walsh's side of the story. Bill Walsh's side of the story is he knew, Paul Brown knew, that if he got a chance to coach somewhere else, people would realize real quick, hey, wait a minute. This Bill Walsh offense, this West Coast offense, which should have been called the Midwest offense, this West Coast offense, that's the reason Paul Brown had success in Cincinnati, not because of Paul Brown. So Paul Brown literally called around the league. This is Bill Walsh's side of the story. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of believe it. I kind of these are two guys who are very, very sensitive towards their, I don't want to say ego, but their legacy, if you will. So he called around to different people. And when they would call Paul Brown and say, Hey, we're thinking about hiring this guy. What do you think? He would give them a, a bad rap and say, no, you don't want him as your head coach. He's just not mentally strong. Green Bay called Paul Brown. Paul Brown told them that's not a good coaching hire to the point where uh, this was this was a few years after because he had already went to Stanford, if I remember correctly. So he went to Stanford and had success, and Paul Brown kind of blackballed him out of the league, and he had that kind of pull. People go, oh, one person can't. No, he had that kind of pull. So that's how he ends up in San Francisco. Um, do you, uh, Green Bay do you passed think- up on him. Do you think that that kind of poll has a lot of um, recognition in in uh, recognition in the league today? Do you think it's more of like a who knows who kind of thing? Because I honestly like when I start thinking, I, I I'm trying to track what you know, Clayton. So I'm you give me all these playbooks to look at, you give me all these podcasts to listen to, and I love it. Um, the thing that I realize is that a lot of names match. <laughs> I'm talking names match like it's political stuff. Yeah. You get a Kennedy type name. You get Nathaniel. I, I thought Nathaniel Hackett, his dad was another Hackett. You get a Parcells, you know, or not, I shouldn't say Parcells, but you get that lineage. And I'm wondering, like, um, is this just an old boys club or what is it? You know, I'll tell you this I've never been in, a, in an NFL front office. Obviously, I've never been a part of a coaching staff, you can tell. But I'll say this, people who have, Michael Lombardi, who's been in and out of front offices, you know, for the last 30 years, he always talks about this. He's like, how in the world does Wink Martindale not have a head coaching job, but X name does, this guy does. It's And he says it's all about who you know. And, and, and you know, Lombardi. And it's all about repaying favors, too. Think about it, man. Think yeah. about the people that have been hired, you know, You'll have a head coach get hired, and he hires some assistants, right? That head coach gets scrapped. One of the assistants goes on and gets a head coaching job somewhere else, and they'll come back around and hire guys from that tree and bring them back in. It's people they're familiar with, you know. And I think I think it's unfair to just say it's all that. I think there's a good chunk of it. But there's definitely something to a whole, you know, hey, I trust this guy, right? I mean, you look at that, that Play Callers podcast alone. 
should sure. tell you that there's there's a lineage there. Oh yeah. I mean it's and it's it's like you said, it's not like it's not well deserved. It's just that there is if you know who you know, then you know. I remember my grandfather once told me it's not who you know, it's what you know. And I was like, Well, that doesn't really quite make sense. Or I should back that up. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Who you know, yeah. And he he tried to get me a job. I'll never uh, forget this for a first time at like a Chevy dealership in Menominee, Wisconsin. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up. And I was like, I told my grandfather, I was like, no, nah, man, I want to earn this job by myself. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be my own man. And the guy denied my dealership. Like he, he denied it immediately as I applied for it, uh, for the dealership. He said like, no, dude, you, you have no quality here whatsoever. And then I sent him a, like a text or an email, I think it was like in 2002. So it was probably an email at the best. Maybe I called him, I can't remember. And he was like, oh, my, my, I was like, my grandfather is this and this. And he goes, okay, well, you're hired. It's <laughs> like, oh, wow. All that right, so that's that. how it works. Good. See, Guess yeah, to and, know. And I never had that, unfortunately, because my family was, uh, whoo, they're, they're not the reference you wanted. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's funny, man. When me and well, Manny started- on the business. Yeah. Well, me and Mandy started dating. I was 17. She was 15. And we were in high school. And I'll never forget, forget the first time she brought me home. She took me home to meet her mom. And she said, oh, you know, is that who, who whose parent? And after she met me, she was like, oh, I love him. He's great. He's awesome. Yeah. Now, who's his parents? She said, Betty, Betty Taylor. That was my mom's maiden oh, name. She went, no. oh, my God, I love Betty. <laughs> Betty is an unbelievable person. And then she said she stopped and went, wait a minute. Is that Mad Dog's son? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Mandy said the blood went out of her face, right? But she still realized that we wasn't cut exactly from the same cloth. I love my dad. My dad's awesome. It's just he has lived one heck of a life. DJ Key in the chat says, hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Uh, Farv and White are my two favorites. That's two great choices, man. Uh, two guys that completely resurrected the franchise. That That is for sure. Brad in the chat, you guys are awesome. Love geeking out with y'all. Same here, buddy. And then Steve Thank Van Ness you. trying to get trying to get in an argument with me or, or setting me up with somebody <laughs> else. He says, you a Notre Dame fan, Clayton? I, I have fallen in love with Notre Dame simply because there are so many ties to the Green Bay Packers. You know, Curly Lambeau played one year under Newt Rockney at Notre Dame. Um, I didn't know this, but I found out actually for the first time this year, one of the four horsemen, this is crazy, one of the four horsemen of, you know, Notre Dame's famous backfield back under Newt Rockney actually was coached by Curly Lambeau in high school football. That was crazy, right? He was like he he'd done a little bit of coaching on the side or whatever. It was either football or baseball, but there was another Notre Dame tie there. And then, of course, man, 
the fact that the Packers passed up and so many other teams did too, they passed up on Joe Montana, you know, in that draft. It's like, God, could you imagine if they had had Bill it's, Walsh and Joe Montana? I was going to say, is that another Bill Walsh scenario? Man, where it's wild. That happens. And, and we are so far, we're not even going back to the itinerary here because it ain't going <laughs> to get. But I love talking ball like this. This is awesome. This is a good pre camp episode. Um, Bill Walsh, actually, from what I understand, wasn't looking at Joe Montana. He went in to look at a tight end, if I remember correctly. He went in to look at a tight end, and Joe Montana happened to be the one throwing that day. And that's how he spotted Joe Montana and was like, that guy's feet. He always talked about his feet, and everybody was like, that's so weird. He was like, they said that he would be on the sideline watching Joe Montana warm up with his three-step, five-step, seven-step drops because everything in that West Coast offense under Bill Walsh was in unison. A three-step and a hitch, yeah. you go here. Like, everything was timed up perfect. And and they said that Bill Walsh was over with his arm, and he's going, look at Joe's feet. Yeah. They're, they're beautiful. <laughs> look, look at his feet. And they're going – the hell are you talking about his feet? What do you mean? Like he's seen that in Joe Montana. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's a that's a tough pill to swallow there too, man. It really is, really, really is. But yes, I'm a Notre Dame fan because, like I said, the ties to Green what, Bay. Can I ask real quick? The Joe Montana draft was that 19? I can't remember. Oh, God, yeah, I was I trying to think too. 1989? No, maybe. It, I think it was earlier than that. I do. You need yeah. to Google that. We need to Google okay. that for sure. Okay. I, I, it's going to drive me crazy. Somebody in the chat, do that for me if you. I'm going to put these guys to work. Find Steve, out. Steve, do Montana something for us. Come on, Steve. Yeah, Brad in the chat says best cheeseburgers in the world world are over there in Marinette at Mickey Lou. I don't know. Mickey Lou's? I don't know. I don't know. You got this plate, dude. They, I'm telling you right now, man. Just hearing people talk about the local dives in the state of Wisconsin and and, and surrounding states is like, I just want to move up there, man. I really Yo, do. But if you do, up. though, you'll get. You'll you'll die of diabetes. Right. You know, it's just it's gonna happen. Right, right. Yeah, I thought it was yeah. earlier, but Steve <laughs> said uh, I'm not a I'm a Notre Dame fan as well. So we're we're now bros, good stuff. And then he said 1981, he believes is from Joe Montana. Okay. And I think that's I was thinking it was in the early 80s because I want to I can't remember what year Bill I should know this with as many books as I've listened to here lately. Um, I can't remember what year Bill Walsh went over to San Francisco, but it was kind of mid to early 80s, I believe. So. But he said, no way. He's checking right now. Um, <laughs> anyway, I love it. I love this type of talk, though. Um, what I was going to get at, I'll hit on it really, really quick while he looks that up. Um, in that Packers offensive line or in the, the Packers-Rams game that we went to, that opening drive, this was the Packers opening drive, okay? They had 11 plays, all right? Now, I'm going to read them off really, really quick so you guys get an idea of what we were looking to accomplish with those openers against the Rams, okay? And, again, I think this was December 22nd. Does that sound right? Yep. Okay. Yep. First play, shotgun, Z motion, play action pass. It was incomplete. Okay. Second play, shotgun, Z motion, pin and pull run for five yards. Shotgun, quick set pass, eight yards to Dobbs, first down. Shotgun, slot shift, power run, nine yards. Um, ace, H flex, jet motion, lead toss, eight yards in a first down. Shotgun, X motion return. Out route pass for seven yards. Shotgun, X motion, sit and dig pass for 11 yards, first down. Ace, 12. Aaron actually can to a run on that play. Okay, I know everybody likes to pretend like he just audibles out and throws passes, but he actually can to a run, seen something in the defense, can to the run, picked up 10 yards on a counter. Okay, next play, ace, X shift to tight, 12, cans to a wide zone right. Twice he can to running plays back to back. Um, then you had ace H jet play action, naked boot. There was a pass interference, no call. That was in front of us. You remember when Ramsey tripped Watson Oh my God! We, yeah. and Jacob with two beers in his hands going, why are you doing? <laughs> it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. But anyway, that, and then we had the shotgun trips. The protection actually broke down <laughs> on both tackles. It was both Yash and Tom just got bull rushed and Aaron got up with one of his eye rolls, stole the ball down and everybody hates him for it. I get it. So with that being said, of those 11 openers, the reason I mentioned that, Many people were saying we need to run the ball more. We need to run the ball more. We had 11 plays. We ran the or we we passed the ball six times. We ran it five, six of which had motion and three had shifts. So the difference between motion and shift, and this is according to Greg Cosell, a motion is when a player moves, the ball is snapped while he's still moving. That's considered motion. A shift is when a player moves, comes set, and then the ball is snapped. 
Now, some people couple all those together, right? They just couple motion and uh, and shifting together, and they just consider that motion. I personally don't. I think that's skewing the numbers, and it would actually be skewing it in favor of my argument that, no, this is LaFleur's offense, right? And when I was saying this all year long, I caught a lot of hell. I ain't going to lie. Fans were like, you just don't want to admit that Aaron's not running the offense and blah, blah, blah. So on this specific drive here, guys, only two of the 11 plays where they're not motion, right? Six motion, three shifts, okay? Now, yes, there was a lot of shotgun there, I agree. If I remember correctly, I wrote that down as well. Yeah, you had of 11 plays, you had seven out of the gun, four out of the eight, right? So when we see Love take over, you may you may see that switch. It may be seven, ace, four, gun. They're still going to see shotgun. There's no doubt about it. But yeah. when you pull this up, I'm going to pull this graphic up real quick, Jake, and cover up our ugly mugs for a second. Um, <clears throat> This is what you got here. On the left side of the screen is your 2022 uh, motion. Now, this oh, yeah. is according to Seth. It's not Waldron. I can't remember his last name, but you can find him on Twitter. He's got like almost 50,000 followers. He is the ESPN analytics guy. Okay, so I didn't I didn't drum this up in my basement trying to prove a point. Here, okay? <laughs> the motion numbers. 2022 on your left, Green Bay had the eighth most motion in the entire National Football League at 22.8% motion in the 56.7%, that's including the shift, okay? He worded it different, but I got down to it. That's what that means. Now, on this side is 2021. In 2021, we were 12th with only 15.6% motion, 52.2% including shift. So why do I say that? Why do I bring that up? All year long, I was telling people, guys, this is the LaFleur offense. 2019 was hybrid. 2020 was hybrid. 2021 started the shift toward LaFleur. 2020, 2022 was LaFleur's offense. Now, of course, Aaron could still change plays. Of course, Aaron could still can he can to the run twice on these openers here, guys. Right. So he he has the freedom to do that. He has his hand signals, all those things. A couple of times you could see him do hand signals on the cam play, one of which was he did miss Watson over the middle on one play that had about, you know, I don't know, a step and a half on his guy. He should have yeah. thrown there. When I watched it back, I went, whoo, that would have been a nice game. I think it was on an incomplete pass. But nonetheless, just want to point that stuff out. 11 plays, seven from gun, uh, four from ace. Again, you had six motion, three shifts, so only two of those 11 openers didn't have any kind of motion, which Clay, completely debunks what we talked about. What's that? Clay, can I ask you one question? Do you think yeah. that possibly that if, if people are to judge and say that this isn't the uh, LaFleur offense, well – is it because maybe that we went from, what was it, 15th to 12th uh, in motion? What if we go to first? And that's the Matt LaFleur offense, meaning that we have that much motion. And and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Because if I listen to the play callers concept, if you listen to what they do and the way that he would branch maybe off because of in this new year, we don't have Mercedes Lewis. We don't have those right. set blocking tight ends. We need guys that are going to be moving around. We need them to be confusing the defense to a point where like they don't know how to set on a defense unless we're stopping with motion. You know what yep. I mean? Like, so is that something that maybe we could just, we can jump to number one or number two and it wouldn't be surprising to you. And I want to say this on those two openers or two of those openers, the H flex jet motion and the H jet. I seen DeGuara do that. And I, and I said H because we know DeGuara is an H back. Yeah, if yeah. it had been Luke Musgrave on the field, you'd probably say F motion, right? Because right. he's more of an F receiver. When I seen him motion, I went, boy, Musgrave right there. Oh, my God. <laughs> All that speed on a jet motion, dude. And not even giving him the ball, but just the, the defense having to be aware of that speed, right? Now, listen, Musgrave could come out and fall flat on his face. I, I wouldn't be surprised. The, the league is tough. They get paid, too. But to answer your question, and somebody said it on Twitter, is like, well, they should have been higher. Okay, I mean, you could say that, but yeah. the argument, not the argument, but the point I'm making is – Last year, nobody was complaining. 2021, nobody's complaining because we won 13 games. Right. Then all of a sudden, we run more motion in 2022, but because we lose, it's going, what the hell? This ain't it. This ain't LaFleur's. <laughs> this was closer to LaFleur's offense. But I hope we do uh, go on up, Jacob. And the reason being, I can't remember the exact statistic. I want to say it was something like um, without motion, average across the league on plays without motion, the touchdown to interception ratio was two to one. But with motion, it was three to one. So, I mean, the, you you really reduce the op, the the chance of throwing a, an interception um, when you have motion, for sure. So, you just gave a thumbs up. Do you see something in the chat here? 
Oh yeah, just a uh, guy giving Brenton Cox Jr. some love, so I had to give him the thumbs up because you know that's my guy. Any seventh rounder, although I will say on record, I don't think Alex Magoo is Mr. Magoo that we can all thank for. All right, he's a camp arm, guys. Give Bro, him they they are freaking out over. And I've heard people <laughs> talk about this in the past with like no name <laughs> coming in, and and I'm seeing it firsthand. And I'm going. I've only been on Twitter for a little over a year. Now this is the first time I've experienced this, and I'm going. <laughs> They act like this dude just freaking won, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what he won. I don't know. <laughs> I, I heard Homer Jesus, on uh, wide receiver Jesus. That's all it is. <laughs> right. you know? and I, heard, go, go, go. I love Kurt Banker. I will always love Kurt Banker. Absolutely. I really Same here, man. He's that awesome. guy is a freaking brilliant quarterback, and I really want him to come back, man. Just come back, Kurt. Come, come on, back. man. Show us how we kneel. Let's uh, <laughs> That kneel down, I love it. Um, Brad in the chat said, how does the blocking scheme and, and quote, illusion of complexity change this year with a new quarterback and such young tight ends? Um, I could see them, like like Jacob was saying, I could see them leaning on a little bit more. I really could. Um, I could see them leaning on a little bit more and, and causing some confusion. Um, uh, the blocking scheme is is really – it's so – it's so not talked about enough. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a dumb red. I don't know how to word that correctly, like a scholar. I, nobody's going to mistake me for Margaret Thatcher. I promise you that. But when you, when you talk about the different blocking schemes, right, that they ran, and, and I don't have the list in front of me. Actually, I do right here. I'll be darned. Let's go roll up. <laughs> Park. So the types of runs they ran last year: outside zone, 36 percent; inside zone, 23 percent; pin and pull, 14 percent. You heard me talk about that on that opener. Yep. Duo, 11 percent; counter, 6 percent. You heard me mention that. Power, 2 percent. They ran one of those plays. Draw, 1 percent. They were very, very, very multiple when it comes to blocking schemes, right? Yeah. And and some people, and this is what I was talking about on, on the the episode before last. I said. You know, it's going to come down to what Brian Bulaga talked about on Wildey and Tausch. Can can Jordan Love handle these line checks, right? Because Josh Myers has hasn't proven that he can handle it. You know, you got a young quarterback and you got like a a Jeff Saturday in his prime. That quarterback can lean on somebody like Jeff Saturday or Corey Lindsley or whoever. Yeah. Corey Lindsley's phenomenal. Brian Belaga did a great job talking about the difference between him and Myers. Um, so that young quarterback can lean on that center. Well, when you have a young center, that young center can lean on someone like Aaron Rodgers. But at the same time, when you look at Jordan Love, you go, hey, dude, he's been in the system for three years. If, if he can get it, he's going to have it this year, right? He is going to have it. And uh, that's exciting for me, man. I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm eager to see it too. Uh, the illusion of complexity—that's something that that started with Bill Walsh mainly in the passing game, but it's definitely trickled down to Kyle Shanahan, Matt Lafleur, and all these guys. You want to make something really simple, but make it appear very, very complex. That's for sure. Um, all right, let's see. Let's get back to the chat. I'm trying to think here, but this thing blew up on us. We're way behind. All right, Steve Van Ness. Um, we got a caller we're going to go to here in just a second before we wrap up. Steve Van Ness says 1979 was his rookie year in his first Super Bowl. I remember now was 1981 against the Bengals. Yeah. So think about this Bill Walsh coaching against his best friend, Bill Johnson, who is now the head coach in Cincinnati. Yeah. And, they, and they came out like on the first <laughs> drive and ran a trick play, some kind of reverse pass. Yeah. But so that was 1979 that, uh, that he was drafted. Wow. That's forever ago, man. It's amazing. Um, here we got in the chat, Tom says, thanks, Tom, for dropping through, bro. He says, uh, do you think the Packers could use Alex Magoo or Sean Clifford like the Saints use Taysom Hill? Mm. I don't see them as the same type of player, honestly, Tom, but I'm a little bit ignorant in that regard, too. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like if, I watch Sean if, Clifford if, a lot. If you do look at um, a lot of Alex Magoo's, he's a much better runner. He's like a Justin Fields but can pass better if you look at um sean clifford he's just an all-around like threat and again people are sleeping on him he's a fifth round guy that people said that uh there's no reason that we should have drafted him obviously there's a reason people thought highly of them um of him so yeah uh i'm not gonna say you know i'm a sucker for late round dudes ryan knows that he hates <laughs> every single take i have <laughs> he hates it but I am on my uh, – I think Sean Clifford could be – you watch him at Penn State, bro. He can throw some stuff, and he can run, dude. He can and run. I do not think Alex Mago is going to make the team in any capacity. I do think that um, Danny Etling is gonna, probably going to be our, our arm quarterback in the uh, – uh, what do you call it? Forgive me. Uh, the practice squad. And I just think that uh, maybe we, maybe we may have something. I'm I got to ask. Sean Clifford – 
Is it Magoo or Mago? I need Magoo. to know. It's, it's definitely it's Magoo. Mr. Magoo. Okay. I see. I don't even know if you're being serious right now. I have no idea. I'm not even lying. I think uh, it's, it's Mr. Magoo. Magoo. Okay. Got it. Look, now, look Steve what, NS said, I pronounce his name Alex Magoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. He's. Hey, he's I told y'all the Kingsley Enigbare's name is that name, and y'all still don't understand that. So, <laughs> so here's here's what's crazy. Which, you, as you were describing Alex Magoo, um, <laughs> and then you mentioned Danny Etling. Danny Etling was that same type of player. Some people thought he might be a wide receiver, and that that might be what Belichick was. I, I can't remember if they drafted him or signed him as an undrafted free agent in New England. Right. But they were thinking, just like Julian Edelman was a college quarterback, let's convert yeah. him to wide receiver. There may be a little bit there. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 mean, do I don't know believe, enough about it. I think he's like 27, 28, so he's mm -hmm. up there. Um, but he has shown, and I think it was like a – God, what was he? Was he LSU? I think he was LSU uh, mm -hmm. quarterback. I don't have that in front of me. Forgive me if I'm wrong. But um, he's shown, and uh, I think – and uh, um, oh, gosh, Andy Berman – I believe he showed that, like, in preseason, Danny Etling, kind of a thing. Not really, <laughs> like, a total thing, but if you right. want to get on that hype train, yeah, that's one. You can you can legitimately look at his numbers and be like, yeah, okay, I can see that <laughs> happening, possibly, in the future. All right, so Dakota in the chat, uh, Dakota in Tennessee says, but the Packers had less motion than the Rams, 49ers, and Jets, and I think the Dolphins. So let's look at it over here on the left. All right, I don't know who's number one. It's number one's getting cut off. Um, oh. by the way, I had to screenshot it, yeah. but you do have the Rams at number two. You're right there. Um, the Jets had more motion. Of course, that was Mike LaFleur. Then it was Green Bay. You had, I'm sorry, San Francisco there at number six. You even had Atlanta too, which that's Arthur Smith, who was, if I understood correctly, the tight ends coach for Matt LaFleur when Matt LaFleur was the OC in Tennessee. And then, um, you had the Jets, the Packers, and then on down the line. So I, I don't think that's 100% correct. I could be wrong. The Dolphins might have been number one. Yeah, I think they were number one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were number one. So, yeah, you're right, Dakota. Yeah, and, and now it comes down to, okay, look at the percentages, right? San Francisco basically ran motion 5% more than Green Bay did. Is that big of a difference? You know, in 100 plays, if you had, if you had you know, offensive snaps in 100 of those, only they only ran five more with motion. Now, you, you may be sitting there saying that's the difference. Could be. I'm not saying I'm right and anybody else is wrong. I just wanted to point out how in 2021, nobody complained about the lack of motion because we won 13 games. 2022, we ran 7% more motion, and now all of a sudden this isn't LaFleur's offense. So, uh, you know, good point, though, Dakota, pointing that out for sure. Let's do this. Let's go to the phones real quick before we wrap up. we got two or, two or three minutes here. Let our guy hop in here. We got Mr. Andy from Kansas. Andy, how you doing, bub? Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, man. What's on your mind, bub? Uh, just listening to the different things you guys are talking about as far as the offensive makeup. And there's so many interesting question marks. Um, I mentioned a few shows ago, just as far as <clears throat> uh, a player who gets, um, we take a look at, you know, the pre-draft uh, um, the, the scouting that goes on. And then after the draft, they continue to scout them, which I guess is what, you know, OTAs and all that's about. Um, there's going to be a lot of experimentation uh, just because when you talk about the different offensive formats, 11 personnel, 12 personnel, 21 personnel, if you look at the Packers roster and you ask, well, which one will we run? You could easily say all of any of those. Yeah. We have, right. You know, so we can't tell. And uh, I'm guessing neither can the other teams, but we know that we're going to run one of them. You know, in each play, there's going to be that kind of set personnel. So I think it's exciting that any of those could be run based on the people that we have. And what's that based on? Well, the pre-draft scouting, the post-draft scouting, and then the experimentation. So compared to last year, there wasn't as much experimentation. I'm not saying the LaFleur offense wasn't being run. I'm saying experimentation. Right. 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 Because we knew that Aaron Rodgers liked to do things that he was good at. Right. Mm -hmm. We implemented, and that's the fourth phase of that, the implementation. Once you experiment and find out what you're actually very, very, very good at, not just as individuals, but now uh, as a collective offense, what can you run that you know is going to work if we just do this? or that it's going to work. Aaron Rodgers was in the implementation stage for such a long period of time 
then when we got new pieces, I don't think we could have the experimentation of those new pieces go on at the same time that Rogers was implemented in what he knew. Now you take that part away, and now we have Jordan Love. Is he talented? Well, yeah, otherwise they would have gotten rid of him already, right. but they still have him. Why? Because he's talented. What's he going to do? We don't know. That's why we're experimenting. So we're in the phase of a whole bunch of guys that we know are talented. Dobbs, Watson, Jones, Dylan, Jordan Love. What are we going to see? That's to be seen. What about the other pieces? Are they good? Well, they're good at something. Musgrave, Kraft, right? And I'm, I'm telling, I'm listing off all these names, and that should be the exciting part. Let's not say, but I have to know what's, what's going to come. No, no, no. We don't want to know what's going to come because <laughs> right. neither, do, neither do the other teams. Yep. Yeah. Let's exactly. let it lay out, right? So yep. if I'm watching a movie and someone keeps asking me, what's going to happen <laughs> next, what's your answer? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yeah, let's watch to find out. So that's the exciting yeah. part. I, I, I'm going to love the graphic. I'm going to make, make a soft prediction here. I'm going to love the graphic during the game where it's going to say in multiple weeks, love is just thrown to eight different receivers. Love is thrown to Ooh. nine different receivers. Ooh. And oh, I remember go. seeing that in the <laughs> 1994, 95, 96 seasons. Yep. Okay. What was the Packers offense ranked in 96? It, 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 I can't remember. I know he number won one. Up. Okay, I know he won at least for scoring. Yeah. For scoring, it was number one. Okay, okay. how many thousand yard receivers was that were on that team? Zero. How Ooh, many thousand? Way. How many thousand yard rushers were on that team? Zero. Zero. Right. He's what was the defensive wow. ranked in points? Number one. How many double digit sack uh, players did we have on that team? Zero. That's Reggie White had good insights, dude. That is Reggie like, White had eight legit. and a half sacks in that season. Eight and a half. That's, that's legit. It. And let me hey, let me let me stop you for a second. Yeah. This looks crazy. I was watching a video earlier of uh, Staley, Coach Staley in L.A. with the Chargers when he was the defensive coordinator for the Rams, and he talked about the the key to his defense that quarters wide you know wide front look was them playing what we call a tight a four oh four and they said you yes you had Aaron Donald in there but what you need is a nose to play the run and and they said word for word you don't need elite edge rushers for this defense right you don't need elite speed at the safety position you need safeties that are fundamentally sound that will come down play top down and play against the run fit um and it kind of goes hand in hand with what you're saying Andy good stuff man you uh you got anything else that was uh, that was really really some really good facts man uh I know you've been talking about about a bunch of things, you know, you know, he, here and there. So, I mean, just in the next, you know, few few podcasts, if if there's just people, I think that want to toss out just fun trivia, see what kind of sticks. I mean, this is that time where, you know, we're we're beyond the draft speculation. You know, we training camp is happening. Things are are, are kind of you know getting put into the oven as far as cooking up something. But just some of this this fun what if stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's just a good time of the year. I think I think to do that, we think during the off, you know, the true dead off season time. No, I don't think so because football is not even on most people's minds, so they don't even want to talk about trivial things. What about the anticipational trivial uh, things? Uh, just one more piece of trivia. I don't know, just stuff that I I think about and have rolling around here. Two thousand eight, uh, that team had. 22 interceptions as a team and the average return was 31 yards Jeez. and they scored six times. Wow. Wow. What does that have to do with anything we've been talking about? Nothing. Just, you know, <laughs> that kind of <laughs> stuff, that kind of stuff just happens when it happens. Game. And if it happens, boy, that's just a lot of fun. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff, dude. Good stuff, Andy. Hey, we appreciate you dropping in, man. It's always a blast when you, uh, when you swing by. Sure. Anytime. Thank you. Right. Thank See you, ya. Andy. Have a good night. Thank you. Love it, love it, love it. That's some good points there, man. Really that good points. That was good, dude. That was yeah. good. Steve, uh, Steve Van Ness in the chat says, I'm really liking the Brenton Cox Jr. Same. <laughs> um, and he does say, yeah, I pronounce his name Alex Magoo. You can already hear Lambo. <laughs> Magoo, can't you? You know they're going to do it. You know they're going to do it. And Steve Van Ness says, one guy you would have loved back in the day was Brian Noble. I have no idea who that is. You know I don't who know who that is. There you go. We're going to have to look that up when we get off the air for sure. Wow. 
Um, all right, man. We uh, didn't hit a damn thing we said we were going to. Nope, we, we didn't even touch on nothing. <laughs> We were going to kind of break down the pre-camp stuff, but Jacob, I say we save it for another day, man. We, okay. I tell you what, if you are able to hop on with me and Ryan later tonight, maybe we do it then. Maybe we kind of hit on that. Just a quick okay. early 53, man. That'd probably be a good time to do it. You got yeah, the floor. I'll, what else you want to share before we go? Nothing, man. I uh, Like I said, I might have to go back to work, um, but I just uh, – can you tell me how many days we have until camp comes? This is man, real no, Packer no. football. We're in the less – we're in one digits here. Let's, Let's go. Look it here. Let's look at Let's it here. Go. You right, can find on, this in your on. Packer net. Uh, practice net the 26th, guys. We are three days away. I love we are three days away. Yeah, and That's tomorrow, crazy. Tomorrow's a shareholders meeting. I had Tim on earlier. Tim will be in attendance at the shareholders oh, meeting, so we'll get some insight gosh. from him. Um, veterans I, report to Camp 25th. You know what that means? We'll hit the slow motion views of the players right. walking into the facility, Just, right? Exactly. Yeah. It was this wearing time last year when – when a player that we're not allowed to talk about right now walked in <laughs> dressed as Con Air, right? So oh we'll God. see who picks up the, uh, the ball and runs <laughs> with it there. But I'm, this is what I get more excited about. Can you see my cursor on the screen, Jacob? I, I can, you know. yes, sir. Okay. So you, like you said, open practice here on Wednesday, right? But check this out. Let's fast forward to the 28th. We are two weeks away from preseason football. Oh, on my the 28th. gosh. But, dude, it's exciting, man. I am freaking Jack. So, again – uh, I, I'm contemplating taking off work to just go and maybe watch some of these practices. So I got some PTO built up. So maybe I do, maybe I don't. I'm just I'm <laughs> trying to figure it out. I'm trying to get this uh, logistically figured out. I would love to go there. I'd love to meet Tim. I'd love to uh, hang out with anybody that's in the Green Bay area. So um, one thing that I will say, and I, I don't mean to step on your toes, Clayton, is that no. if anybody is in Green Bay, if anybody's in the Wisconsin area, if anybody has any insights, let's all you know, get together. Let's talk about it. Let's start live streaming together. Let's start putting out some content that is very valuable because guys, I don't want to brag on Clayton or nothing, but in those last live stream, Mr. Devondre Campbell shared his post <laughs> saying that like, Hey man, thank you. I appreciate it. And that's a sign of good things to come. Um, you know, we've been getting some great, He's been getting some great interviews. No, we, we, He's we. been doing some great stuff. Um, this whole freaking network is unbelievably benefited by the fact that we are getting really just beneficial people that understand that football is more than what do you always say? It's not just a, it's not a team. What is it? You're, you're not just building. It's not just a team. It's a family. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, that's we're, what the Green we're Bay Packers franchise. We're, we're not collecting talent. We're building a team. That's what they exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that is something that should be shared and spread around the football nation. The Green Bay Packer Nation is a special bunch of people. We need to take care of our own. We need to keep, um, you know, just collecting around the good content. And guys, I'm telling you, this is the best content that there's out there right now. So go pack, go. Let's go. Yeah. I'm enjoying it, man. And, Again, it's a testament to what Ryan's built, and really, it's the fan base. Um, yep. You've seen, guys, what made what made the show great today was this chat. All these knuckleheads in here that are knuckleheads <laughs> like us. Andy hopping in. We had Tim on earlier. Jacob joining me here, man. It, we want this this show to be total access, meaning we look at all avenues. We look at the salary cap. We look at the X's and O's. We look at the fun stuff. We, you know, we're going to cover the highlights, the press conferences, all that stuff, but it's a way to kind of bring the fans together. It's not going to be something where we beat people down when they don't know something. You're never going to hear me say, um, uh, with all due respect, I do this for a living. We are not the same. You're never going to hear me <laughs> say that, right? Um, because we're all learning together, man. I, when I when I highlight these things, like these defensive fronts, right, and I point this stuff out, I get more interaction when I highlight that stuff. And they go, man, I didn't know that. It's because I just learned it, right? We're all learning. We're learning together and we're just having a good time doing it. That's what it comes down to. And more importantly, what Steve says here in the chat, Clayton, Notre Dame football is going to be fun this year, though. <laughs> I think it will, too. I think it will too. And uh, I'm I'm already pounding the table. I hope that it doesn't come to a bad draft pick. I hope we come out and make the playoffs this year. But but Alt, the offensive tackle for Notre Dame, if we are in a position where we say Jordan loves the guy, but we still got an early enough pick that we can bundle together, go get that guy to protect his blind side for the next 10 years. Woo! No, just another connection, man. Notre Dame and uh 
and Green Bay for sure. And there's some people right now. There's Michigan fans. There's Michigan State fans. There's probably Wisconsin fans, I'm sure, that are going, shut up about Notre Dame. You know, I don't care about it. Yeah, <laughs> just the way it is, man. That's what makes it great. We're going to get out of here. We're over to the hour mark. We completely screwed this episode up, but thankfully, <laughs> we made it a blast. So really, really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for taking the time to hang out with us. Um, thank you for those that are listening on the pod. Not sure when it'll go live, but really appreciate you making us a part of your day as well. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go, Pat, go. The power sweep. Actually, it's the it's the lead play in our in our offense. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, we drive down on the first man who is inside. Pullback, we tell him to take the first man outside the offensive tackle. No one shows. He goes right by them and steals inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker in, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley.